We're talking today with Leslie Spike of Norton Shores, Michigan, and the interviewer is Jane Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Wes, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? Well, I was born, I'm a native of Muskegon, Michigan, uh, born in 1948 to uh, Dolores and Frank Spike. Um, I have two older sisters, of which has been deceased now, but uh, uh, they too are also natives of Muskegon. Uh, what was your family doing for a living when you were a kid? Well, actually, uh, my mother was a registered nurse, and my father was a journeyman tool layout inspector for Continental Motors mm -hmm. at the time. So uh, I came from a well-educated family, yes. All right. I mean, did your father have a college education or just a lot of technical training? There was a lot of technical training there, okay. you know. All right. Uh, and did you finish high school? Oh, absolutely, yeah. What year? 1966. Okay. Uh, and then what did you do when you graduated from high school? Well, actually, I went, uh, I graduated when I was 17. Okay. So when I turned 18 years old, the lure of money, you know, grabbed me, and uh, I went to work for Brunswick Corporation, as a matter of fact. And uh, I got laid off of there, and then I bounced from Campbell White and Cannon Foundry to, you know, and I tried... Um, uh, going to MCC, and I realized that I was not college material. Yes, Muskegon Community College. Muskegon Community College, yes. Right. So I, uh, I didn't really get uh, involved in the uh, apprenticeship until after Vietnam. So I was raised in the housing projects mm -hmm. in, in Muskegon. Um, my mother got cancer early on, and I remember as a very young child that uh, she couldn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, so with that being said, of course, my father was the main breadwinner. But we were not poor in the sense of being poor. Yeah, you had a roof over your head. You yeah, had food yes, eat. absolutely. Even in the projects. And, uh, um, you know, it, I always had clean clothes. I always got a new set of clothes before school, new shoes, and mm -hmm. that type of thing. But I... I my sisters, my oldest sister is 13 years older than I was, mm -hmm. and my middle sister was nine years older than I was. So I was kind of the baby of the family, mm -hmm. and I was spoiled rotten by them. And I mean literally rotten. So uh, they were very good sisters, and I loved them dearly. All right. So that period, kind of 66, 7, 68, before you go into service, uh, how aware were you of the Vietnam War? Well, the media, of course, uh, in the media, I should say, Vietnam was raging at that time, mm -hmm. 67, yeah. 68. Tet Offensive of 68 mm -hmm. was uh, probably one of the bloodiest years in the Vietnam mm -hmm. conflict, if you will, the Vietnam War. Um, and I knew that my draft number was going to come up. So... I started looking at all the other branches of the service. Well, I didn't want to go in the Marine Corps because I knew where they were going. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to go in the Army. I knew where they were going. And uh, the Air Force, um, I, I, and I don't know why I didn't look at them any further, but I, I really didn't. I've always wanted to be in the Navy. So I had gone down and I talked to the recruiter. And he said, you know, we have a reserve program that if you decide to enlist, we will keep you here for a year and allow you to get some type of rank before you go active duty, which is a two-year stint mm -hmm. in the regular Navy. And I thought, well, that doesn't sound bad. He says, however, he says, if you get the greetings from the U.S. government, he says, do not open that envelope. He says, bring it down here, and we'll get you enlisted in the Navy. Mm -hmm. Well, at that point in my mind, I said, I am not going to Vietnam. I'm not going to do it. So I'm going to enlist in the, in the Navy. Right. Thinking that I was going to get on board the USS New Jersey or something, the big battle wagon mm -hmm. and all this business, and go to the Med. I was going to go to the Mediterranean. We were going to go Goodwill tours and all that. Uh, no, that didn't happen. Okay. So um, when did you sign up? I signed up in uh, 
April of 68. Mm -hmm. And it was for a six-year jaunt, but they said two years of it would be active. Right. And one year kind of semi-active. You'd go through your training. Mm -hmm. And then whatever time was left over, you would do that in the reserves mm -hmm. should you come back. I um, I remember going in, th they said, because in the Navy you have a rank and you have a rate or a job, mm -hmm. what they call it. And I, my mom was an RN, so I thought, I'll be a hospital corpsman, mm -hmm. you know. So I started my studies. They sent for a book, you know, and you have to go through this book, and they would give you testing. <laughs> and um, I remember these guys teasing me. On, on the drill weekends, they tease me, well, hey, you're going to go with the Marines and all this other kind of stuff. So I said, no, no, I'm not going to. No, I'm, I'm going to be a, a, a corpsman. He says, that's what we mean. You're going to be with the Marines. He says, because that's what the, the medics mm -hmm. for the Marine Corps, that's where they get their medical. I said, N no. So I had gone into the administration office, and I told them, I said, I, I, wait a minute. I said, the hospital corpsman, I said, are they, Mar did they go to the Marine Corps? He said, well, the Marines are a division of the Navy. He says that's where they get their hospital training, their, their medical. Um, and I said, well, I, I said, that, would you go to Vietnam? He said, well, you, Wes, you probably will go to Vietnam. And I said, no, 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 I'm not going there. No, you don't understand. I didn't sign up for this. I'd have gone. And they said, well, you're allowed one change. I said, okay. I said, give me the form. So like an idiot, you know, I signed the form, and they said, then we'll give it to you. We'll let you know when you finish your drill for the weekend. I remember walking out the door, and I stopped, and I turned around, and I said, what, what, by the way, what did I sign up for? And he said, well, gunners make guns. And I said, well, this was a shoe in, Jim, for me. I am going to be on the USS New Jersey or a heavy cruiser or something like that. I'm going to work on the big guns. Well, no, that didn't happen either. All right. Let's uh, kind of pull the story together a little bit. So you, you enlist in April of 68. Yep. Uh, do you go off to boot camp right away, or does it oh take yeah. a while? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so where do you go for boot camp? Great Lakes. Went to Great Lakes, Illinois. All right. Um, and what did boot camp consist of at that point? <laughs> well, basically, it was drilling and... Uh, taking care of your uniforms and basically a lot of stuff to get you to fall in line with the disciplines of the United States military mm -hmm. from a naval standpoint. So All right. Uh, and, and how easy or hard was it for you to adjust to that? It was easy for me. I mean, I, I liked the military life. Um, it wasn't as hard as the Army or the Marine Corps, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Certainly the Marine Corps, it wasn't as hard as me. But, uh, um, yeah, I, 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 I did well in boot camp. Because okay. you mentioned that you were the baby of the family and spoiled rotten. I was wondering yeah. about the transition from that to being in Navy boot camp. Or had you just done enough work and things like that that you were used to doing what you were told? Um, I wouldn't say I did, did what I was told really too much. But um, I, I, I liked the military, and uh, um, I, I just never had a problem with it. I could see what the disciplines were and why they were the way they were, you know. So, uh, you know, I really didn't have a problem with that. And how long did the boot camp last? <sighs> Probably about three months, I'm going to say. Okay. All right. Uh, and what kind of act, did you get any training in anything? Oh, yeah, you know, they bring you through the, uh, uh, the gas houses, you know, and all that business. But for the Navy, uh, part of that training was on the USS Haver, which was docked at, and, and at some point it was supposed to go out for a two-week cruise, and that never happened. It was, uh, it was being worked on and all that, so it just really didn't happen uh, to do the cruise. However, we did have to do the shipboard training where the compartments were, the ladder ways, you know, and, and mm -hmm. the bulkheads, and the, of course the armament that was on there and, and all that business. But a lot of it consists of painting. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of painting involved. All right. And what type of ship was that? That was a PCE, a patrol craft escort. So okay. it was a little bit smaller than a destroyer. Mm -hmm. 
We we put the rigging up for the flags, you know, for the um, for the Memorial Day, and, and then we were allowed to go into Chicago. Well, we didn't have any money. I was there with a guy from uh, Jackson, Michigan, mm -hmm. and he was uh, well. Let, let's go into Chicago, Wes and I said, so, well, anyway, we went into Chicago, and uh, uh, <laughs> we just, we stayed in a mission there because we didn't have any money. He did. He had a little bit of money. But uh, that was an eye-opener, being in Chicago basically all night mm -hmm. and finally stumbling upon this mission and going in. Uh, but we were only there for probably, I don't know, a couple nights, spent mm -hmm. the night there, and then came back to the base. It was just easier to come back to the base. Yeah. You know, the meals were there and all that stuff. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, so when, once you finish that, what do you do next after boot camp? Well, we came back to, you know, again, civilian life, mm -hmm. and then you'd continue your studies until you got orders to go active duty. All right. And so basically, were you now assigned to a reserve unit in Muskegon, and so you show up for the weekends or? Yeah, basically, that, that, that's the way it was. And then, of course, when we got orders, uh, my f orders were to go to uh, San Francisco, uh, Treasure Island, and wait for wherever you were going to go, whether there you were going to go to the fleet or whatever. Okay. Now, so the part where you were reading your manuals and you make the switch from uh, corpsman to, 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 to gunner's mate, uh, was that while you were with the reserve unit? Yes. Or, okay. Yep. All right. Now, at w what point do you get uh, gunnery training? When does that come in? Well, that's interesting because you don't get gunnery training until you go active duty. Okay. Physical gunnery yeah. training. And, and, and that's a very good point, Jim, because I didn't get gunnery training on the big guns. Once I, w once I got out of or received orders to Da Nang, Vietnam, mm -hmm. um, after three months, and I spent three months in San Francisco. Um, and, and while I was there, we were, uh, they put me in a gi dunk or a sandwich area where you had to maintain the, the vending machines and mop the floors all that <laughs> business. And uh, I got my orders to Da Nang, and my heart sank, of course. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, you got to be kidding me, because you don't look at Vietnam at that time as being any any areas being peaceful or being well protected. Mm -hmm. The first thing you're thinking of is I'm going to be in the field and I'm going to be in firefights all the time and, and the possibility of getting killed or injured or, uh, always enters your mind. Well, then we got, uh, we got orders to go home for a 30-day leave before you went to Vietnam, mm -hmm. and I did that. But before we left to, to, to do the 30-day leave, uh, we said, you're, you're going to come back, and your orders are going to go to Coronado, California, and you'll receive further training there. And I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute, Coronado, California is a UDT SEAL base. I'm n they don't get this. I'm not, I'm not going to be a SEAL, and I'm not <laughs> going to be underwater demolition. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't know is that they were setting up training at that time for riverboats. Mm -hmm. And the majority, uh, from what I understand, of the riverboat personnel there were reservists. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, we, I, I came back to Coronado. Okay. I want to actually back up a little yeah. bit. So you, sure. you spent three months in San Francisco. Yes. Uh, did you go into town at all? <laughs> yes, I did. Um, and it's funny. Most of the time when I went into town, I went in alone, and I never got bothered. And, and a lot of these guys had come back all beat up and everything. And, and uh, uh, when I told them that I would go into town, I said, no one ever bothered me. And I go in full uniform. Mm -hmm. Of course, back then it was uh, summertime, or, or, or it, spring, and we were in whites mm -hmm. then. And um, I said, I, I remember going into town and into Chinatown, and that's where a lot of these guys were getting beat up. And um, n never came back. I never had a conflict with anybody. But I remember going into town by myself, and I remember 
going into a bar that was an an all gay bar. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was coming from the Midwest. We didn't have that here yeah, at the yeah. time. And I remember, and I thought, gosh, these women look awful strange, you know. And they were dancing on the bar and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, and and I'm looking, and one of these gals had a mustache, and I'm thinking, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> For me, mm -hmm. I'm in the wrong <laughs> place. And one of them asked me for a date, I recall. <laughs> I just got up and moved out, and I, I, I never went into town again. I went, <laughs> went back to the base. <laughs> but I was so close to going to, uh, again, down to Southern California. Right. Okay, so let's go down now back to, to Coronado. You get there, now what happens? I get there, and they tell us that we're, we're going through they said, we're, we're going to go through small arms training, and, and we're going up to Camp Pendleton, and the Marine Corps is going to train you in small arms. Now, I'm really getting a little bit, you know, I'm starting to think, you know, something's happening here. This is not the big guns in the fleet. This is small arms, and gunner's mates in the fleet don't mess with any of that. Well, they do, but n not very good. And I remember going up to Pendleton, and I had a little Snoopy pin little gold Snoopy pin that I wore on my cap. And these Marines were saluting me, thinking that I was an <laughs> officer. And I sat down in a six-by with the rest of the crew, and they said, Wes, you need to take that off. He says, if these jarheads see that that's a Snoopy pin, they're going to beat you senseless. <laughs> so I, I did. I did take it off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I'm not going to you know, risk a beating because of that. Anyway, we uh, we we s stayed out of out of the camp in, in tents and all that business, and then we went to the, the firing range, and they were training us on some M16s, uh, 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 Remington Wingmaster shotguns. Um, we didn't get too much training on the M60. That was more of a self-taught thing later on, but uh, you know, 45 pistol, and I remember that the DI was set me up with this 12 gauge shotgun and I had shot this so many times that I was really getting sore in my shoulder and I made the mistake of holding that away from my shoulder because it was so sore and touching that off and the butt of the gun came up across blackened both of my eyes and my nose was bleeding and that's all that DI needed that and he called me out in front of everybody and dressed me down as an idiot and the, the whole nine yards and never forgot that. And I haven't forgotten it in 40 some <laughs> odd years. But with that being, and I was stuck with that weapon for the rest of the day anyway, Jim. So by the time, I mean, my whole shoulder was black. And, um, but it was something that I never forgot. And, and, and I thank him for that to this day because it was part of the discipline uh, that you received that could have very easily saved my life mm -hmm. in some course of my time in Vietnam. Right. So, okay. um, now, so then, so you do that, that weapons training at Camp Pendleton, uh, and then how much time did you spend at Pendleton, do you think? I think we spent Probably a week, I'm okay. going to say. Now, in the course of that time, I was supposed to receive, to go to what they call SEER training. Have you ever heard of survival, evasion, mm -hmm. resistance, and escape? Mm -hmm. And in my records, they have that I went to that class for three weeks. Mm -hmm. And they are classes. They're set up. Yep. And um, it was signed off by a lieutenant. I, I never went. Never went. They just signed it off. <laughs> they needed bodies for Vietnam, and they weren't going to mess with taking the time to do that. Well, with that being said, then we went like, went back to Coronado. And I remember one of the last classes we had was they said, you're going to get a 10-day protocol leave. Go home make arrangements with insurance and everything and blah, blah, blah. And that's when it registered. I talked to the fellow next to me and I said, 
what is he talking? I said, don't they have insurance? I said, don't, don't they take care of their own here? And he looked at me and he said, you really don't know what's going on yet, do you? I said, well, I, I know I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I said, but no, I don't. He said, dude, he says, we're, we're going to Vietnam. He said, you're going to be in combat on a naval support activity base or something. This guy was, this guy was fleet. Mm -hmm. So he had been in the Navy for a while. I says, well, the take care of insurance, what do they mean? He says, life insurance, in case you get offed or whatever, you have insurance to help your folks or whatever, mm -hmm. should you desire. And my heart sank. And I have to tell you, Jim, I was afraid. Mm -hmm. I was afraid. Uh, because what we had seen on the media through all these years was just nothing but heavy firefighting and village is burning and, and, and all of that. And I, I, I thought of myself coming out of the projects as a fairly tough kid, mm -hmm. you know, but that didn't appeal to me one bit. Now, I don't mind servicing my country or anything, but I certainly didn't want to go to Vietnam. I mean, we're halfway around the globe, you know, and it's not as though it is today where you can pick up your cell phone mm -hmm. and call home. From a war zone. Yeah. That, no, you can't do that. So. Okay. So, what was it like to go back home that last time? <laughs> well, of course, you you went out and, and, and got drunk a few times with your buddies and all. Well, what buddies were still there? Because mm -hmm. a lot of them had already gone. And um, I guess it, it really you still don't really realize until you're ready to step on the plane to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, that did happen. I, I boarded in Muskegon. It's a funny thing about the Navy is that we went over one by one. We didn't go over as a group, like not like as a uh, the Army and the Marine Corps where they would go over in a group. In Vietnam, most of them went one by one, too. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. And uh, of course, you're getting on the plane, and as the plane is taxiing down and, and you leave your hometown, and you look, you, you, you look out the window and you're looking down at Lake Michigan and, of course, over on the other side is Mona Lake and, and you're thinking, am I ever going to see that again, you know? And um, so you are afraid, mm -hmm. you know? It's the unknown. You're going into the unknown. And this is, this is, it's an adventure, but it's not the kind of adventure that you want, right? you know? So... Anyway, so you go off, uh, and then do they fly you to Vietnam? They they did us. They, uh, uh, some of the Marines and everything were taken over by ship mm -hmm. and everything, but uh, uh, they did us. They flew us over there, and uh, I can remember landing in Da Nang, mm -hmm. <coughs> and we had made one one hop too on the way over there. Now that I recall, I think it was in Guam. Mm -hmm. Uh, refueling or right. whatever. And um, we got into Da Nang. And I remember stepping, my first stepping out of the fuselage and breathing the tropical air. And there was a different scent about it as well. And it was humid and it was hot. And I remember go going through and back, just kind of backing up in San Francisco. They gave us a shot called the gamma globin shot. It was a big shot, and it was a painful shot. But when I got off of that plane, I was glad that I had that shot because it supposedly was supposed to thin out your blood and get you more acclimated to the tropical. And um, I remember getting off the plane and looking around thinking that there was going to be a firefight. Of course, I'm in Da Nang. Mm -hmm. Da Nang is big by then, and I mean, they are just occupied by tons of American soldiers and sailors and airmen and all that mm -hmm. business. So we were there probably in Camp Tian Sha. This is, n this is Northern I Corps now. And uh, I can remember they were 
sending us to detachments. They had given a lot of, we, we, we were in a, I think we were probably in an area about as big as this room. Mm -hmm. It was outside and there were benches set up. And I remember myself and two other Swabies getting over in the latter corner, way over there. Why, I had absolutely no idea because, you know, it, where we were going and what we were going to do was already determined. Mm -hmm. And as some of these guys stayed in, in Da Nang and some of them were going out to NSA detachment, Naval Support Activity detachments, and I remember they had gotten down to us. We were the only three guys there. All the rest of the guys had gotten mm -hmm. up and took off to their barracks. And he said, you three guys, he says, are going up to the northernmost detachments in South Vietnam. And I thought, oh my God, you've got to be kidding me. The very last place in the world that I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. So, two of them, got, we, 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 we got our orders and got our sea bags packed and we went up by what they call a ski lack. It's a YFU and it's a flat bottom scow and I mean you're going along the South China Sea up north mm -hmm. and you're hitting all these waves mm -hmm. like this and it, it's an overnight stint. And I remember we entered the Quaviat River, the Dong Ha River. Some guys call it Dong Ha River, some guys call it Quaviat River. Mm -hmm. But I remember going inland, and Quaviat was right on the mouth of the South China Sea mm -hmm. and the river. Two guys got dropped off there. One was a cook. I can't remember what the other guy was. And then for me, I'm the last... I'm the last guy, and we're going up by YFU in the rivers, and I'm looking on the sides of the rivers, of course, and expecting to be hammered at any mm -hmm. time. And we got up to a little place called Dong Ha. Well, Dong Ha was quite a bit bigger than what I envisioned because we were going, I, unbeknown to me at the time, we were stationed with the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. Well, the ramp, or where these YFUs would pull up with, they would drop the ramp and there were, su there were supplies mm -hmm. on board. And this area that they called the ramp was all cemented and they had uh, rough terrain forklifts that would come in and lift off the supplies and it was more or less a staging area mm -hmm. for that. There, of course, it was all um, fenced off, three-strand barbed wire, you know, all that business with bunkers in certain areas. And I remember getting off and throwing my sea bag on this six by, this truck, and they proceeded to take me up to uh, the base. And when we had gotten up there, there was n no one that I could visually see in the naval part of this. And I remember them dropping off my sea bag and jumping off of this thing and looking around. And I could see the mountains in the distance of Laos. And the truck had pulled away and there was no one there. And I see these little dust devils out there, these little, you know, down there. And I remember looking up and I said, this is the very last place on your green earth that I want to be. And uh, so I, I did happen to see someone, and of course you had to go to the admin building, check in, and all that kind of stuff. So when was this? <coughs> this approximate would, date. Yeah. This would be July of 69. Okay. So the war is still going pretty, oh, yeah. pretty hot and heavy. Or the conflict. Mm -hmm. To the guys that were there, it's a war. It's not right, a conflict. Right. It's a war. Um, our duties, uh, I was assigned to a certain section. They had sections of people that would mm -hmm. 
basically the security people because I was a gunner's mate striker uh, wanting to be a, a, you know, a petty officer or a gunner's mate. I was assigned to security. And security there uh, was, they had like, I think it was four sections, you know, if I'm not mistaken, but where we would rotate. You'd have a day shift and a night shift, and then you'd rotate to a night shift to a day shift mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And I remember being assigned to the ramp, security on the ramp. And you get to know the guys in your section pretty well because you're basically in the same hooch or the same housing, mm -hmm. uh, which made sense. So you become very tight with these guys, but <laughs> you, you you lose your, <laughs> your your sanity when you're over there because these guys are crazy. They do crazy stuff, and, and uh, I laugh at it now, but I can remember. Now, Dong Ha was one of the northernmost areas in mm -hmm. South Vietnam, and they would get rocketed pretty regularly. I think I had been there for two or three days. And they had instructed me that in the m middle, well, right by where my rack assignment was, there was a trap door. And this trap door was probably, well, it was a, it was a four by eight sheet of plywood. Mm -hmm. And underneath the hooch, they, the CBs had dug trenches for us to be into. And I can, re I can recall probably a second, again, a second or third night, you hear this <laughs> and the siren would go off, which means we got incoming. And I can remember the leading petty officer of my hooch saying in incoming. And all I remember is opening up that trap door and jumping into the um, into the trench. There was water in the trench. So that was a real eye opener in the middle of the night. When the all clear siren sounded, I remember getting up off of there and the LPO, the leading petty officer, turned on the hoot, on the light and he said who was the first one in the trench? I said, I don't know, I guess it would be me. He says, did you rip the door off of the floor? I said, I don't know. I said, I, I guess I probably did. He says, then you get your ass down there to the CBs, he says, and have them come up here and fix it. Now? <laughs> right right now? It's in the middle of the night. He said, it doesn't have to be right now. He says, but he was a little warm mm -hmm. at me. But uh, I can remember rats running across my chest. And I hate rats, and I hate them to this day. <laughs> but that's what I recall about that, mm -hmm. Jim. We, at various times on the ramp, we would get incoming down there uh, where we got into some of the guys exchange fire and all this other kind of stuff in you know, firefights and that's where we got our combat action ribbons and all of that um, I do remember spending time we had gotten a shipment of black powder on a barge and we were coming into Tet kind of a stupid time to be moving black powder and not removing it off but for whatever reason, they had me standing watch, the mid-watch, on this black powder. And I remember going out there, and I had two bandoliers of M16 clips and all of that stuff. And I had taken tracer rounds and did a couple of full clips of tracers in there. Because I had no idea, you know, if we were going to get a attacked or whatever, maybe this would scare them or mm -hmm. something, which it probably wouldn't have anyway. And 
I remember standing watch on this, and I was screaming and yelling all night long and singing, and I'd take random shots, you know, with the... And we had the EXO, on, which was a younger guy. And uh, morning came, and I remember Lieutenant Beatty coming in. And this, th of course, this is secondhand that I'm hearing this, but I heard it from the guy that was in the in the admin building there. And he said, Beatty came on. He says, and he said he wanted to know who the lunatic was that was out on the on the barge. So he told the XO, he says, go on out, and, and they told him, he says, go on out, get Spike, and bring him in. He says, I'll do respect, sir. He says, you go out and get him. He says, well, what do you mean by that? He says, y do you hear him? <laughs> <laughs> this is a man's insane. And uh, anyway, for whatever reason, I, I came back in, and they wanted to see me, and he sat down. He says, Spike, he says, come on in, sit down. So I did, he says, what are you doing? I said, I'm protecting myself. He said, Judas Priest, he says, you know, he said, that it could have been the whole frickin' army out there, the NVA, he said, you, you'd have stood them off. And I said, well, that really wasn't what it was about. And I said, here's the thing. I said, the Vietnamese, I said, are like our American Indian. If you kill somebody that is dinky dow, I said, or I said, it's very bad for you to kill someone that's insane. He says, okay. He says, I got you. Mm -hmm. And I said, so if I went out there and I said, and, and it says, and I'm spending all this time on that black powder, I said, there wouldn't have been enough of me. I said, to put in a thimble. I said, should they have gotten. Mm -hmm. He says, well, that's really, he says, that's pretty smart. And I said, I don't know how smart it was. I said, but I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's one of the things that I remember, that and being blown off of the, you know, uh, by that 175 long time we were talking about okay. earlier. Yeah. Well, that was an off-camera story. So uh, why don't oh. you talk about that? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we had, uh, in this, on, on the ramp, they had a, uh, what they called a point bunker which was next to the river, but it was out a ways. And um, be because of its distance from uh, the rest of the, you know, the, the sailors there, we had two people that would man that bunker just because of its logistics and all that business. But so myself and this other swab jockey was in there one night and because we had a mid-watch, there were two guys out there. We decided that I'd sleep a few hours, he'd sleep a few hours, vice versa. In that bunker, it was, it was a double bunker, so in that bunker, on the top part of that bunker, there were fire ports. And the fire ports were generally, I'm going to say, a, a foot by three or four feet long. And we had them, there was one on this side and one on this side and then we had two in the middle that we could that we had a, uh, that we could defend from mm -hmm. and it was my turn to sleep and i remember obviously going to sleep but when i woke up i found myself on the floor with a bloody nose and of course i had no idea how i got there i was still disoriented and after I got my bearings, I asked this guy, I said, what in the world happened? He said, I probably should have woke you up. He said, but the Army pulled up with a 175, and I'm thinking it's probably from 16 feet, maybe 20 feet away. He says, and when they touched it off, he said, you fell on the floor. He said, you got blown off of the sandbags. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what just happened, you know? Of course, you don't report things like mm -hmm. that. I mean, you're in a combat zone. I mean, I figured this happened probably to everybody that was too close to a cannon that went off. 
But later on, talking to the guys that, uh, uh, that I associate with now, some of those guys were on tracks and that had long toms. And I asked him that, it, are they powerful? Will the percussion of that knock a man off of? And they said, oh my gosh, Wes, if you were 100 yards down from a 175, he says the percussion of that would knock you over like, he says, and you're a big guy, and so wouldn't have any problem knocking you down at all. Mm -hmm. So he says, you really got away kind of lucky, you know, that you got blown off the sandbags, but that's all that happened. Well, of course, I lost my hearing because of that, but you don't report that stuff. Mm -hmm. it, um, so that, that was... Okay. So about how long did you spend on doing security there? About five months. Okay. I think about five, let's see. It was uh, about five months because latter part of January of this following mm -hmm. year now, yeah. February, January, I went to river security. My billet had opened up. Dong Ha Naval Support Activity was being turned over to the Vietnamese. We were no longer going to be a presence there. Now, what was the basic purpose of the base during those first five, six months when you were there? What was going on? Your security, but what's the Navy doing there? Well, the Navy is bringing in, we're bringing in supplies to the Marine Corps, the okay. Army, Air Force, mm -hmm. all of that business. Air Force generally flew in their own yeah. business, so we didn't get, to, I shouldn't even include them in that because I, um, but we would bring in supplies, everything from wrist watches to sea rats, mm -hmm. um, sea rations. So we would have everything from clothing to groceries to all of that all right. business, and they would disperse that from there, wherever they were going with it. So yeah. now, did you have your own landing craft or river craft that Not were, at that ba time. were based? Don't play with your microphone, please. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So, so it's basically just a supply base at that point. It's just and, a supply and, base. And you're right. parked there as security because yep. they're waiting to assign you yep. to boats, but that hasn't yep. happened yet. Okay. Well, it's not only security against the Vietnamese. It's also security against our own guys, you know. I hate to say that, but, mm -hmm. the, you know, there was pilfering. Okay. Now, on a base like that, I mean, did you, did you have people using drugs or did they have a way of getting drunk or anything else like that? Oh, I, oh absolutely. Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of amazing when... Of course, now we're dealing with a lot of that, uh, those years following Vietnam, how all these guys were drunks, mm -hmm. and they turned into drunks. Well, you know, they, they, they would bring it in by the pallet loads, you know, beer and mm -hmm. all that stuff. Of course, the officers would more or less get the, you know, the goods, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the liquor as yeah. opposed to beer. But, oh, my goodness, yeah, <laughs> whatever you wanted. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know too much about drugs mm -hmm. there. I never got involved in, in, in drugging there, with the exception of I had a station with a fellow from uh, Tennessee. His name was Weir Glidewell. I, I'll never forget him. He's, he's deceased now. But um, I was always having trouble because during the staying awake because during the day we would fill sandbags mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Well, then you'd go on watch at night while well, you're tired. And I would fight that. Oh, my gosh, I would fight that. And by this time, this was my section. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember we're telling me, he said, look, he says, I've got some people from home that I went to college with. He dropped out of college to go to Vietnam. <laughs> go figure. And... Uh, he said, take a couple of these, he says, and it'll keep you awake through the night. Well, I resisted that and resisted that and resisted it. Because the drug scared me. Mm -hmm. And coming from a, a family whose mother was an RN, mm -hmm. you know, we knew the, the, the danger in drugs. I finally took them. They were called black widows, and they were amphetamine. I mean, mm -hmm. oh boy, I mean, you want to talk about uppers, Jim, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I was awake for three days, but boy, when you crash, you crash big time. And I remember telling Weir, I said, don't you ever, ever ask me to try these again. Mm -hmm. I said, these scared me to death. Well, <clears throat> that's about really 
all I can remember, Jim, about okay. about that. Well, th let me tell you one thing. We were going, we were coming off of a watch down there, and we were on our way back in a six by. And I remember being overrun. And I can remember that now this is between the ramp, which was about three miles away from the base. Mm -hmm. And I can remember getting underneath the six by up over the axles. Uh, I'm a I'm a tall guy now. I'm a but I'm only like two hundred and six pounds and I was six four then, mm -hmm. so I'm about that big around. Yeah. And, but I remember getting up over the axle, and I remember th there was uh, firefighting going on. I remember black pajama bottoms running by the truck. And then I hear machine gun fire, which is our machine gun fire, because you can tell the difference between mm -hmm. Chinese communist weapons and ours. And, and it died down, and it was quiet. So I crawled out from underneath the truck, and the other guys had come who had been, who had gone over in the brush. And there was an army duster that was there, and a duster is a, like a six by with a set of, some of them even had 40 millimeter mm -hmm. guns mounted on them, but this one I think had a, a quad 50 on it. 50 caliber machine guns, which yes. are powerful enough. Yes, oh, oh absolutely. And uh, generally there were four of them mm -hmm. in a quad 50. So there was twi quite a bit of power, firepower there. And boy, you want to talk about scared then. Because um, that really could have been a casualty then. Um, particularly when you're ambushed, because you have no idea when mm -hmm. it's coming. You know, that's the element of surprise. Okay. So, so basically, it was possible for. You know, do you think these were North Vietnamese sappers that came in? No, or, I don't think it's or sappers Viet or North Vietnamese. Or I think it was Viet Cong. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and was it common for them to come into that area, or was that kind of attack pretty rare? It was pretty rare for us. Um, you know, one of our biggest allies there were the kids, because we would always give them food, you mm -hmm. know, and we chat with them through the wire, mm -hmm. you know, and all this business. And um, being in security, of course, you walk the wire all the time. You walk the fence okay. all the time. So you would, uh, you know, you'd talk to these kids, and oftentimes they would tell you, they couldn't pronounce my name Spike. Mm -hmm. They would call me Sabike. Mm -hmm. Sabike. And they'd come up and say, Sabike, VC, come tonight. You watch. Of course, he spoke broken yeah, yeah. English. And, uh, but they were a tremendous ally to us. Um, of course, we gave them food, we mm -hmm. joked around with them, made them laugh, um, and they made us laugh. But they would let us know if something was going to come down. Mm -hmm. They said, they may come, they may not. They said, but uh, one of the things, you know, the kids would tell us is, wait for the dark of the sky, the no moon. Mm -hmm. You know, watch for that or if it's raining at night mm -hmm. when it's white because you don't hear them, you know. And uh, so they, they were a real, they were a real asset to our living through that ordeal. Mm -hmm. But to remember all the things that went on there. Okay, all right. Uh, so you guys gonna first half of your in, in, in Vietnam is kind of spent doing that kind of work. Right. Okay, so now the orders come um, they're turning that Dong Ha base over to the Vietnamese, and now where do you go and what do you do? I remember that my CEO came, uh, called me in to his office. And he said, Spike, he says, we're going to be leaving Vietnam. He says, we're going down to Da Nang. He says, because we're in shipping, we're in liturgy. Mm -hmm. we're, and um, he said, uh, I see that in your chit, in which you can see that in my order, mm -hmm. that y your chit is a request, that's what they call it in the Navy, that you wanted to go to riverboats. And you are a gunner's mate, he mm -hmm. says. And he says, however, your billet was not open at the time, and we needed qualified people here. Mm -hmm. So he said, that's why we didn't let you go. And I said, I, I read that on the chit, sir. 
He said, I'm going to give you a choice. He says, you, your billet is open downriver at Quaviet, or why don't you come down with us? We'll party. He said, we're going to be in Da Nang, dude. He says, that's party city. He said, we'll just party down for the rest of our tour and we'll go home. And I said, no. No, sir. I said, I'd really rather go. In one of my stupider moments, I know there isn't such a thing as stupider, but st <laughs> <laughs> but regardless of that, in one of my stupider moments, <laughs> Jim, I said, no, sir. I said, this is what we train to do. This is what I want to do, which really, when I first came in the Navy, it's the last thing that I mm -hmm. wanted to do. So he said, are you, do you know what you're, are you sure you want to do this? He said, do you know what those guys do? And I said, well, I hear them, and I said, I can see them down river when, he said, but they, he said, if that's what you want to do, then so be it. I'll mm -hmm. sign your orders, dude. So he did, and I went down and um, got assigned to an LCPL. They had taken the PBRs, uh, the, really the workhorses for the, uh, it was a fiberglass boat. Um, we restored one in Muskegon mm -hmm. today, today, you know, and um, anyway, my boat was not a PBR, it was an LCPL, which was a, a World War II converted river craft. Mm -hmm. The first riverine people there were the Coast Guard, and they had LCPLs. They later came out with a fiberglass version, but we, mm -hmm. we had a, a metal version. And we had a 50 caliber, fore and aft, 60 calibers on, on you know, M60s on mm -hmm. the side, plus our small arms, which consisted of a, uh, two M79 grenade launchers. Um, I, had a, I had an M16, 12 gauge shotgun, and a an M14 with a night scope. Mm -hmm. So that's a conventional rifle. It's a conventional rifle, but set up for night and sniper right. stuff. Um, my job was to make sure that the guns were operational, that they were kept clean, that we had the ammunition we needed on board. Um, for any type of thing, whether we were going to use an M79 grenade launcher or whether we were going to use a 50 caliber. The 50 caliber is a very, very good weapon. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very old weapon, but it is, Browning did his job when he designed that. But, um, and we used that many times. Now, were you assigned to an individual craft or? Yes, okay. I was assigned. They went by, the PBRs were boat numbers. Mm -hmm. Ours were call numbers. The base was Big Dance, mm -hmm. and our boat, my boat, was Sierra. Mm -hmm. So when they called us, you know, uh, Big Dance Sierra, and we'd call back Sierra, you know. Um, it was a where the PBRs were a twin water jet, double engined. Uh, river craft with a draft of probably nine inches to a foot on full full bore underway, whereas the LCPLs had a draft probably of about three feet. Single prop, single engine, diesel. Um, in a way, it was a, it was a better craft than PBRs. Not so much where I was, but in the Delta, PBRs. The engines are hooked to huge jacuzzi, jacuzzi pumps. Mm -hmm. Well, in order to get the jet craft, uh, like you see on the kids driving them on the mm -hmm. lakes today, mm -hmm. there is a suction that is on the bottom of that. And these engines turn the, uh, the pumps 
to, it sucks in the, the, the water into the impellers and the impellers shoot it out through mm -hmm. nozzles, which are controlled. They don't have rudders, mm -hmm. they control them with the jet nozzles, where we had a rudder. The bad part about the PBRs is that the Vietnamese knew this and they would cut up weed beds, send them down river and they get, they get caught up into the suction thing mm -hmm. and they're dead in the water. Whereas we didn't have the speed that they did. Mm -hmm. I think top end, Jim, probably about 17 knots, about 20, 23 miles mm -hmm. an hour. Whereas the uh, PBRs could hit 29, 30, 32 miles an hour. That's cooking pretty good. Yeah. Um, so with that being said, it wouldn't make any difference whether we had weed beds or not. The screws mm -hmm. on our thing would just chew them up and, yeah. you know. So we weren't as fast as they were. Uh, PBRs had twin 50s, single 50 mounted aft, uh, M19 grenade launcher, automatic grenade launcher on theirs, and then they'd probably have a M60 mm -hmm. as well, where we had the 60s on the side and a 54 and aft. Um, so firepower, they may have had a little more firepower than we did, but when you're shooting 50 caliber, mm -hmm. that's a lot of firepower. Okay. So. It, now, what kind of reception do you get when you arrive at the base? Because you're kind of the new guy coming in. Um, I can't remember. It, it couldn't have been traumatic because I don't remember it. Okay. Uh, they just assigned you a rack yeah. and a boat, and you're to report there at such and such a time for briefing or debriefing or whatever. Yeah. And you had been in country for six months and so forth. Oh, yeah. It maybe yeah. looked like it by then. Yeah, you're starting to. But it, it, you go into a point of. You're seasoned for that job, mm -hmm. and now you're breaking into something yeah. new. Even though you're in river security, it's a completely different environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are no sandbags to protect you there. You are just an absolute sitting duck in the middle of duck season, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you will. Um, but with that being said, there were boats that got dressed down pretty good. Not, not so much as in 1968 during Tet, which is understandable. Mm -hmm. And um, the PBRs were the ones that were picked on the most. Why, I don't know. Uh, but they seemed to be picked on the most. Um, Again, I can only remember a couple of days or weeks that I was there, Jim. And then it was it was uh, River Division 543 mm -hmm. PBR. And uh, they used to have swift boats there as well, but uh, they were long gone before mm -hmm. I got there. Swift boats being uh, PCF with patrol craft fast. Mm -hmm. um, but they too had a large draft. So for... For for river patrolling, that's not a good thing. Uh, that river was controlled by tides as well. Mm -hmm. So you had to watch what you were doing there. I remember one time at night we got caught onto a sandbar, and we just couldn't get off of that thing. So I finally had to jump in the river with a, uh, um, a line and try and pull us off of that sandbar. I remember one night we were we were motoring up for a night patrol, and there were two times, there were 12-hour patrols. We call it port and starboard. One was night, one was, one was day. And there were four-hour patrols, or longer. It could be longer. If there was a boat that was down or something, it could get into a 24-hour patrol or whatever. But we didn't have a lot of river to patrol, probably 10, maybe 11 miles. And back then, there was a curfew on the Vietnamese. When the sun set, you were not to be on the rivers. And this one night, we were, we were motoring upriver and just kind of barely cruising. 
and we happen to see what they call a bum boat. A bum boat is a sampan. Mm -hmm. We call it a bum boat because they come around to the boats when they came in and they'd bum stuff, cigarettes and all mm -hmm. stuff off the other guys. And we saw this bum boat coming down river and it was dark. I mean, we could have we could have shot them. We could have opened up on them. Because you, know. you, you have no idea. I mean, it could be loaded with, uh, you know, explosives to get rid of the boats or whatever. But I remember there were torches on both ends of that bum boat. And we had another boat come up with a call traffic cop, which was generally had an officer on board. I was down below. And uh, I think I was napping or whatever. And our boat captain said, well, go on down there and grab some Zs and, you know. And I remember him telling me that the, 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 the traffic cop came up and tied up alongside of us. And he said, uh, wake up, Spike. So he, he woke me up and brought me up on deck. They said, you have corpsman training. And I said, no, 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 I, no, I don't. They said, yep, it, it says in your record that you had corpsman training. He said, but I said, it doesn't matter. He says, the boat that's coming up here right now, he says, has got a pregnant woman on it. He says, you're going to look at her. I says, and do what? <laughs> and... He said, look, I don't think she's going to pop a kid yet or something similar mm -hmm. to that. An officer generally wouldn't talk like that. But I said, so what do, you, what, do you, what, what do you want me to do? They said, well, we can't bring her on. Our base was next to a Vietnamese Navy, what they called a junk base. Mm -hmm. They had junk boats. He said, we're going to put you on, a, on the bank. He says, and we're going to take these other two guys in with us. Get them clearanced. He says, then we'll come back to get you. And I said, well, but wait, 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 wait. I said, you're going to put me where? He said, get over on the bank, Spike, with this woman, and we'll come back and get you. What, what am I supposed to do with her? said, just be with her, protect her. I think, now we're in hostile area up here, Jim. I mean, we're, the NVA is not far away. You can see their mm -hmm. campfires at night. So here I am on this riverbank with this woman. And she's as big as a house, mm -hmm. and she's holding on to my fingers, my two fingers. These two fingers, because I had an M16 in this. And she's going through labor. Mm -hmm. And she's, oh, like that. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. I said, I'm in hostile. She's screaming out here, you know, black as pitch again. And you're here. All you have is a sampan, a pregnant woman. And she's going through labor pains. And I can feel for her, but I am scared to absolute death. And I think, because you're alone. They didn't, they, they didn't, both boats took off. Mm -hmm. So they left me with a sandpan. Of course, they doused the, the torches, you know, so we're black. Anyway, she didn't deliver, thank God. And, um, and I mean, literally, thank God mm -hmm. that she didn't deliver. They came back up, of course, put her on board the the junk boat, and brought her back down to the, to the base. Apparently, she was breached or something. Mm -hmm. you know, she was going to have problems. And so anyway, I got back on board there, and I thought, well, you ought to get a silver star for this one. <laughs> but that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you remember things like that, I mean, that was the one event there. There were several.
So now you're up at, at the base at, at Quaviet, and you're now in these converted landing craft conducting patrols. What types of missions were you carrying out? Well, basically, our job was to deny the waterways to the enemy for contraband, whatever they were running, uh, mm -hmm. arms generally, <coughs> um, and or food supplies. Uh, that was basically our mission. However, we would do extractions of troops, insertions of some troops, basically being in a um, in a special ops unit, <laughs> which we didn't know at, mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, we would um, insert special forces personnel. We would work with the Green Beret. We would work with the Recon Marines, uh, SEALs. Uh, we didn't do too many SEALs, mm -hmm. but uh, Army snipers, Marine Corps snipers. Um, and then, of course, after their mission, you know, we would, at such and such a time, at such and such a location, so many clicks upriver, we would pick them up at such and such a time. Sometimes that was peaceful. Sometimes that wasn't peaceful. Um, for the most part, I can honestly say that it was peaceful. Mm -hmm. um, I do remember being in, well just a, a little thing to, that, that goes along with this, I can remember being in Washington, D.C., and we were going through, well, with these veterans, other veterans, we were going through the Vietnam part of the American history, part of Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. And I was bringing my, to, to go into the Vietnam era room, you have to walk through the fuselage of a plane. And when you, when you get in there, off to the right-hand side, there is a dust-off helicopter or a medical helicopter. Mm -hmm. Mannequins are putting a stretcher on board, and there are various artifacts from Vietnam. And, and, and I was explaining to my wife, this was, and this was, this is a, you know, dust-off helicopter chopper. There were four gentlemen in there uh, with red satin jackets on, and they had such and such ranger outfit and all that stuff. And one of them looked over at me, and he says, sir, he said, were you in Vietnam? I said, yes, sir, I was. And he said, well, he says, uh, where were you? And I, or or what, what branch of the service were you in? I said, United States Navy. And he said, oh, he said, so you were in, you know, shipping and all that stuff. I said, uh, no. He said, well, what, what did you do? I said, I was a river rat. He said, what year were you there? I said, 69, 70. He says, oh, my gosh. <laughs> he says, well, we get down and kiss this guy's feet. <laughs> and... And, of course, these guys <laughs> got their attention. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> he said, why, why? And I said, why, why would you say that? And he said, we were under a horrendous firefight in northern i -Corps. He says, the Dong Ha Qua Viet area? Mm -hmm. He says, that's where you were at? And I said, yes. And he said, they were unable to come in and get us. And this guy says, he says, I remember this boat coming around the point, and he says, and they were just blazing. He says his guns were just blazing. He says they came up onto the, uh, they beached it, grabbed us, pulled us on board, took off. He says in that rear 50, he says, was just singing. He says, was that you? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I said, mm -hmm. It could have been. He says, oh, my gosh, thank you so much. <laughs> and you have to think, Jim, I said, what, what were these guys thinking? I said, in their minds, for a split second, mm -hmm. they were going to die. Yeah. And uh, you realize how important that was to them. Mm -hmm. We were brothers. Yeah. You know, at that time, the, the, the joking around you being a ground pounder and you being a squid or a fly boy and a... All that, or jarhead, and all that stuff st stops. Mm -hmm. Your brother's in. Mm -hmm. 
And it isn't that you're fighting for the red, white, and blue. You're fighting to get your brothers out of there. Okay. So did you have firefights like that occasionally? Oh, yeah. Yeah, occasionally, yeah. Well, probably more than occasionally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> more than I wanted. Okay. Uh, now you had mentioned off camera uh, another incident that's worth noting. Um, and you said one of these teams coming back and one of them having a strange aroma about it. Oh, my gosh. That was, <laughs> we, we were to meet a reconnaissance marine, recon marines, again. So many clicks up river at such and such a point at such and such a time. And we had gone up there, and they were on time. They were waiting for us. And we pulled up, and our boat wasn't like a PBR. We couldn't get, if we beached it way up there, we wouldn't be able to get it off. Mm -hmm. So w we were back a little ways, and I remember pulling these Marines on board. <laughs> I pulled this one fella up and sat him down. And I remember we, we, we came off the, the, uh, the bank, headed back to Quabiat. And I remember this sickening, putrid aroma coming from this guy sitting next to me. And I turned to him and I said, dude, what is that smell? And he said, and he had a bandolier, <laughs> a necklace of ears that they had cut off the Vietnamese. Now, if it was a fresh cut, Jim, it would have been one thing. Mm -hmm. But that rancid smell, he had to have these on for a while. And he said, we just came on to whatever the, the North Vietnamese would call their patrols or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he said, they didn't have anybody standing guard. He said, so we killed them and cut off their ears. And I'm thinking to myself, what have we turned into? I mean, seriously, mm -hmm. what, have we, what have we turned into? And it may not necessarily been right at that moment, but you have a chance to process that on the way back to the base or whatever. And it was the same philosophy. If they don't have all their parts, they don't go to Vietnamese heaven or Buddha or whatever, whatever that is. And I thought, what, what, have we, what have we turned into? In those thoughts, uh, as, as you go back in time, you wonder about that. W would these guys have done anything like that if they wouldn't have been into that situation? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to think about that stuff. Jim and I do to this day. Mm -hmm. You know, what did I turn into there? Mm -hmm. uh, because like we said before, you know, taking the lives of men, particularly those where you see their face, and you have the decision of uh, killing them or allowing them to live for possibly a split second or whatever to kill you, that decision lies in a, in a second, not, sometimes not even that. Mm -hmm. And it's a hell of a thing to take a man's life. Uh, in most of the situations when you're firing, would you even be able to see who you were firing at? Or was it usually gun flashes? Or well, I, the, the two that I did were in the river putting in a percussion mine, uh, um, mm -hmm. a pressure mine, I mean. And what would happen is that they would sink these to below the surface of probably a foot or so, just below the surface. And when the boats would run over them, of course, it would push that trigger down and, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 blow the boats up. One of our mail carriers, as a matter of fact, was in one of those boats at one time, and he almost died. He survived. He got mm -hmm. thrown clear of the, 
of the boat. So uh, I didn't, this particular night that that incident happened, I didn't see them. We had come around the point of a river, and we were, it was like a snake, and we were going up toward Dong Ha, as a matter of fact. And it just so happens the two Vietnamese trainee uh, uh, gunner's mates that I had on my boat happened to be looking in the starlight scope, which is, I don't know if you're familiar with those or not, but they magnify the light right. so that you can see in at night. And they happened to spot him, them. And they called me there, and I, and I verified that, you know, what they were doing. And I told the boat cra captain, I said, you know, we can't let you, I need to, well, anyway, um, we killed them, and mm -hmm. I killed them. And, um, in, a, in, in a sense, it is a thing that you have to do, but in another sense, what have I become, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, that was another incident that you never forget. Sure. One day we were going up, we were going to go up, water was a big thing because we'd get this water and it had so much chlorine in it because of the bugs and all that mm -hmm. business. We were going out seaside to the gun line, which we called the gun line, which was our destroyers mm -hmm. and all that stuff, three miles out, no big deal. But what we, we were going over the bar. Do you know what the, the bar is, is a sandbar. Like a sandbar at the river mouth. At the river mouth. And it can get pretty wild out there. If you've ever seen what the bar is like in the, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the river. It's what they train the Coast Guard in. Mm, it escapes me right now, but. Uh, waves are huge. Mm -hmm. They're just absolutely huge. And I remember going, we were going up to go out to get fresh water, and our boat captain decided to turn around. He said, it's too rough. I was up on the forward mount holding on to the butterfly, with the handles in the, of the 50, just to hold on. Mm -hmm. And he had made the turn on a wave. And as we were coming down, we surfed down. And now that boat was 32, 33 feet long. Mm -hmm. We weren't at the bottom of that yet. And we surfed that down. And I'm thinking we must have mellowed out because we didn't go under the water, but it came up over the prow. And brother, if that doesn't make you a believer, because in that surf, you wouldn't survive in that surf. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't have uh, life vests on. All we had, <laughs> we didn't even have our flak jackets on, which would not which would have been detrimental yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway if you had fallen in the water. So um, that was another incident. But there are times, and I, and, and I don't know whether other sailors, uh, thought about this, but there are times, Jim, when you just get so tired of it, you think, if I jump in the water here, it's only like a 7,000 mile swim. Serious. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm serious. And the South China Sea is loaded with hammerhead sharks, loaded. But you get so sick of it and tired of it and you think, I want to go home. Okay. Now, you were mentioning having uh, Vietnamese trainees on, on the boat yes. with you. So were you starting to, were you working a lot with Vietnamese personnel? <laughs> yeah. I had two of these guys, Phuc and Phong were their names. I don't know if that was their first name or their last name or whatever, but that was Phuc and Phong. And they were <laughs> Gunner's Mate trainees. And we attached ourselves very closely. And I can remember picking up these squirts because I'd have them under both arms. 
And they, they, of course, they, they'd tease me and they'd laugh. And most of the time I couldn't understand what they were saying. But they say, Sabaik, buku map, which means big, very mm -hmm. big, you know. And, you know, you tickle these guys and all that stuff, and we, we became very close. And I've often wondered what happened to them when we, when we left. But yeah, they, you'd, you'd, you'd train them on, you know, because they were going to inherit all of our stuff, our boats, mm -hmm. our armament, everything. You know, they were going to inherit that. So they should know how to operate mm -hmm. it, you know. And that's what my job was okay. to train them. And were they learning anything? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They were the Vietnamese are, are, are quick studies, they're very smart. Uh, for the most part, and I know there may be a lot of GIs that don't agree with me on that, but you know, for the uh, for what they had, they were fierce fighters, and justifiably so. Mm -hmm. We were in their country, and and I'm not trying to make an un-American statement there. I'm glad that I served in our military, but probably not in, in, in that event. Yeah. You know. Aside from the pregnant woman, did you have much contact with civilians at all? Once in a while, I'd remove a fish hook from one of the, one of the fishermen out mm -hmm. there. They'd, and they used a tobacco to, one of them was in a lip, I remember one time, and I, we had uh, cutters on board because you never wanted to pull it back through with the barb, so you mm -hmm. know. And, but this one guy had one caught in his lip. And I remember removing it, but I cut the line and pulled it through the other because they were very poor. You have mm -hmm. to understand that. They were very poor. So to buy these kind of fish hooks, we're not talking about the little fish mm -hmm. hooks here. We're talking about hooks like this. And I remember cutting the line and pulling that through his lip through the other way. And then he, he just without even thinking, Jim, he had tobacco there that, or whatever he was, I assumed it was tobacco. Mm -hmm. And he just put it on and thanked me for it and they went about their way. Oftentimes, uh, if, we, if we had the, uh, the patrol where we were in the harbor in front of the base, we'd be checking what they would call Kong Cooks or their identifications. Mm -hmm. And we'd call them over, Lai De Mao, you know, which means come over here now, and they'd show us their, their identifications. Oftentimes, they would give us fresh shrimp. And I mean, this shrimp is still swimming around. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were, it, it was a funny thing about those people. They had nothing, but they shared nothing. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, it didn't make any difference if they had if they had one shrimp, they'd cut it in half and give you. you know, that's just the way they were. Um, I can't say that I fell in love with them, but I fell in love with the peasants' philosophy, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Okay. All right. But you didn't have them working on the base with you? Or they did. Okay. They did work on the base. Um, they would come in and they would clean the hooch and stuff like that. Um, not so much in river security. We didn't have that yeah. there. In Dong Ha, they would. Mm -hmm. uh, they would have them do laundry and stuff like that. But um, when we were on the river patrol boat base, when it was an ATSB base, it, they, okay. weren't, they weren't on there at all. Okay. No. Okay. Um, now are there other particular incidents from the time um, at Quaviet that stand out for you, either on missions or in the base or oh. funny or serious? We had a, a boat captain that came on board, came out of the fleet. He was a, a new guy, an FNG, what they call it. I'm not mm -hmm. really a, a freaking new guy. And he came on, came on board. He was a bosun mate, and uh, second class petty officer, I think. 
I can't remember his name now, but um, I remember he came in out of the fleet, and he was going to, and most of us were well-seasoned by this time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were, we'd been on the rivers for, I think I was in probably my 11th month, maybe. Mm -hmm. And we were on a patrol, again, a night patrol. There was an island that was north of the base, but w west. And we had, he had decided that he wanted to patrol this, the northwesternmost mm -hmm. of the island. We were turning around, heading into, back to the main river. And we received small arm fire. And this guy being new was looking at the map, at the dash of our, of our boat was in red lights, so it didn't impede your vision, mm -hmm. your night vision. And he was calling in army artillery. Now you gotta remember, this is a village. Mm -hmm. Civilians are in this village. He's gonna call in army artillery. And keep in mind too, Jim, we're motoring now. We're in, we're in constant motion. And he gets on the map and he calls our position, our position in. And you can hear this coming in, this <laughs> in <laughs> right in back of the boat. I'm going to say it was in the water, thank mm -hmm. God, but right in the back of the boat, probably, I'm going to say, 50 yards. And I remember our mechanic, our, our Engineman, getting up, and he was already at a machine gun mount, and I remember him going over to him and ripping the um, the microphone out of his hands, and I remember him saying, "Give me that," and he called in and had them stop the the firing, and of course the boat captain wanted what was going, you know, and he said never, ever call in our position. He said, the Army will put that in your back pocket. He says, mm -hmm. they will calculate. And they said, they'll pull it right in your back pocket. He says, these guys are that good. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, he, was, he kind of got reprimanded from the, <laughs> from the engine man. Mm -hmm. But uh, he wasn't a very good boat captain. He was, he was a guy that would uh, assign duties to the boat painting and stuff like that, and he'd go up to the hooch and go to sleep, where the rest of the crew would be down there turning to. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had an ensign there that was similar to that, and he had talked to me, and he says, I had come in from a night patrol. He says, Spike, I want you to work with the ship fitters here. We're gonna mount a new mortar on here, 60 millimeter mortar. I said, on the boat? He said, well, of course on the boat. Where else? <laughs> and I said, the superstructure will never hold the recoil of that. He says, don't worry about it. It's a trigger-fired mortar. He says, no big deal. I says, it won't hold it. He says, Spike, if I want you to mount a field howitzer, I'll, I remember him to this day, mm -hmm. you'll do it. And I said, yes, sir. So I worked on it with the welder. The ship fitters are the welders and mm -hmm. all that stuff. And they mounted the transom on there. And we're going to be, we're going to be enlightened before we go out on a night patrol. Mm -hmm. We're going to get training. So they had put the round in there, and of course, this, I, I remember our ensign looked like Howdy Doody. I mean, he had freckles <laughs> on, he had <laughs> the glasses like that, and you know that kind of a smile and. You know, and all this stuff. And his name was Ensign Mayer. I'll never forget him. And he said, uh, we're going to have a demonstration and all this stuff. Well, I'm in the back of the pack. I'm in the back of these guys. And they put the round in there, and like I said, it was trigger fired. Mm -hmm. And they trigger fired that thing, and that whole transom went <laughs> like that. On the 
And I began to laugh, and I said, I told you so, I told you so. Well, I, I, as a result of that, I got EMT, which is extra military, EMI, extra military instruction, mm -hmm. which means that I had to go out and I had to burn the crappers. Are you familiar with that term? Yes, but you should explain it for the benefit of the audience. For, for the benefit of the <coughs> audience, we have two or three whole outhouse mm -hmm. that would have 55 gallon drums cut in half and slid, or in thirds, and slid underneath these holes for the outhouse. And when you did your duty in there, when it became full, we pulled this out and they were full of kerosene. And we would torch that and burn the waste. I think I got that duty for two months besides <laughs> the, the rest of all of that. Mm -hmm. and, um, but it was worth it. <laughs> it was worth it. Um, I got caught one time surfing behind the boat by Commander, Lieutenant Commander Nicholson. And we were out one day and it was horribly hot because there I think the, I think the highest we had in our hooch was like 123 something like that because they're Quonset huts Jim mm -hmm. they, they heat they're like an oven yeah. they heat up in the summer and but we were out on a day patrol and I said hey guys I said let's let's throw in a life preserver a life ring I'll hold on to it I said you can it and I says and I'll hold on to it and I said if it gets too much I just let loose okay so like I said these guys are nuts anyway and so we did that and of course my idea I was the first one to do it. And w w he motored out until we had the slack out of the line. And then I, and then I, just, I had my arm like this, and I just told him to, to can it. So he, he did. And you're going along, you know, in the, in, in the water, and it formed a bubble over me. So you could breathe in there, and you're doing almost like a body surfing behind this boat. Unbeknown to us at the time, Lieutenant Commander Nicholson was flying over the Chicka Rivers on that day. Now, he never did it before. Why he did it this time, I have no idea. Divine intervention or something, maybe. The Lord uh, probably thinking, well, this guy's really stupid. <laughs> he needs to be caught or something, whatever. Anyway, <clears throat> when we got back in, the person from administration came down as we were docking. And he says, uh, Commander Nicholson wants to see you guys. Okay. We had no idea that what was going to happen. We got in his office and he said, close the door, boys. I want to talk to you. So close the door. And he said to us, he said, funny thing happened to me today he says I was going along the rivers he says and checking the river boats seeing how you guys were doing he says and I came upon this this boat and he says and there was a wake behind it like a bubble he said almost like a whale or something or a dolphin was following this boat he says and the funny thing was about it and he had to have this all set up mm -hmm. in his mind. He says, the funny thing about it, he says, is that this dolphin or whatever it was never got any further away from the boat, and it never got any closer to the boat. He says, did you guys see anything like that? He says, I think it was your boat. Well, he knew for sure it was <laughs> our boat. And the boat captain looked over at me, and... He says, um, he says, uh, Spike, he says, what, or Commander Nicholson says, Spike, he said, do you know anything about that? I said, I don't remember seeing a whale or anything behind our boat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said, well, let's cut the crap. He said, do you guys know that there's a war going on here? <laughs> and of course, I said, well, Yes, sir, I, I, I know. He said, 
He said, if you weren't one of my best gunners, mate, he says, I'd have your ASS tech up on the wall. <laughs> I said, I, 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 I have no excuse. It was hot. He says, I don't care. He says, but there's a war on, guys. No more. He says, do I make myself clear? I said, crystal. <laughs> he says, okay, you're dismissed. Remember, I'm going to be watching you guys. Okay. Right. Okay. So was your unit sort of small enough that somebody like that lieutenant commander knows you by name, or did he just? Yeah, okay. yeah. There was only, I think, 61 guys at the time mm -hmm. left on the base. He... He knew who the crews were. Remember, there was only a crew of four guys. Right. You had a boat captain. You had a, 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 a seaman that would take care of most of the deck stuff, the lines, the ropes, you know, that kind of stuff. You had an engine man whose primary job was the engines. And then, of course, you had a gunner's mate. Now, we're, when you are in combat, everyone's assigned a, a firearm. Mm-hmm. Um, and the boat captain generally, you know, rocks the boat. He, he's the one that is what we'd call the coxswain mm -hmm. of the boat, drives it. And um, so I think there were, I'm going to say maybe eight crews that were still there. Mm -hmm. Now, also, Jim, you had minesweeps, which were MSMs. You, have you seen uh, the war movies where the front of the thing drops down and the, you know, the, the boat drops mm -hmm. down and the guys get off? Yeah. Excuse me. Those are river sweeps. And they would have two of those on each side of the river, and it would come back to a float which would drag the river for mines. Mm -hmm. We did have those there as well. Uh, in fact, one, another guy from Muskegon was on a sweep. Um, so, you, you know, you had incidents like that. It wasn't all full-time combat. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't. So uh, we, we did have some good times there. Not n few and far between, but nonetheless, there were some good times there. Okay. But go ahead. Okay. I was just going to ask, good times. Did you get an R&R &R while you were there? <laughs> did you get to leave the base? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I went on R&R, &R, never went outside of Vietnam. Okay. Um, I could have, but I didn't. And in fact, one guy even uh, said that he'd pay my way to go with him down to Australia, mm -hmm. which is one of the R&R &R places. And I said, no, 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 I don't want to do that. So, because... I was crazy enough probably not even come back. I right? mm -hmm. go, go out in the bush and stay there, you know, um, in the outback. Um, but anyway, no, I didn't do that. But I went, I went down to R&R, &R and I made the mistake of this was kind of like an R&R &R combined with Corman had sent me down there for dental. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, why don't I take a few more days and just do R&R &R as well? I said, well, if you want to do that, that's fine. So I had contacted my old CO from at Dong Ha because he had told me, if you ever want to come down, don't come down by ship. He says, I'll send a chopper up to get you. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, well, that's pretty cool. So I contacted him, and he says, don't get on a ski lack. He says, I'm going to send up the coachman to come get you. They're gonna, they make runs up there, and Quav yes, just a little bit out of their way. They'll do it. Mm -hmm. So they did. And <laughs> I got on board this Huey. And these two guys, the, the, the pilot and the co-pilot, were laughing back and forth. They were chatting while I was getting in. And I remember the co-pilot looking back into the chopper, and he says, buckle up, squid. So I, I did. You, you know, and then, my gosh, Jim, I got to tell you, that was a ride from absolute hell. 
these guys took off and they're laughing. I mean, they're, <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden, and they're chasing Vietnamese. Now, they remember, we're on the South China Sea now. Mm -hmm. So it's like being out at Pier Marquette in Mesquite, mm -hmm. sugar salmon. And they're chasing the Vietnamese. Now, remember, these guys are only about six or eight feet off of the ground. And they're shooting along there. Now, the fastest I have been in Vietnam here for this past year has been maybe 30 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour at best. These guys are doing 100, over 100 knots. And I mean, now you've got to feel for how fast you're going because you're that close to the ground. And they're laughing. And these guys can turn these things on a dime, these Hueys. And they're going up and they're making a sweep and they're turning this thing around on a dime and my stomach is up into my throat and I'm sicker than a dog. And these guys are really laughing. They finally get me down to Da Nang and I'm at Camp Tianxia. And <laughs> I spent my time there. My CEO went out and got me so drunk that I was throwing up green biofluid. Because he knew all the speakeasies and all mm -hmm. this stuff in, a, you know, all the illegal places. When you're in shipping, you get to know all that stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, he had made arrangements for me to get a ride back up there, up back up to Clavier. Lo and behold, I get on the chopper, and these two same clowns are in there. This pilot and co-pilot, mm -hmm. same guys. Same thing. They finally set me down. And I said, you know, I said, with your rank and everything being considered, I said, I'd like to take you on a boat ride sometime. I said, come on up sometimes. I said, let me give you a boat ride. He said, see you later, squid. <laughs> <laughs> and, away <laughs> and I never saw him again. But um, they knew exactly what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> I, you have to laugh about it now, but back then I was pretty warm about that. <laughs> um, yeah, th things like that, sir, as we, as we talk, mm -hmm. things like that surface. Sure. And, um, All right. Okay. Now, are there other particular things that stand out for you uh, before we move you back out of Vietnam? Uh, There probably are, but I'm not thinking okay. of them. But you think we kind of characterized pretty well what you were doing during that year in Vietnam. Yeah, oh yeah. Okay. okay, so when do you leave? I left, uh, when did I, gosh, when did I get back? I got back in July of 1970. Mm -hmm. Okay. We and came back on July 3rd because I remember there was a guy that was getting off the plane. And, of course, there were, there were, firecrackers and stuff going off and all that stuff. And this guy got off, and he's huddled down like he's dodging bullets. And come mm -hmm. to find out, this guy was stationed in Cameron Bay, which was a R and R place yeah, for. Yeah. And he was an admin. You know, the phony guy. And anyway, we got into uh, trying to think of. Did you go to San Francisco or Seattle? No, or I else? went to. Uh, Long Beach. Okay. I, f I, f I flew into uh, San Bernardino. Mm -hmm. Went from there to Long Beach to separate. They were, they were going to separate us, so, which was cool. I was all mm -hmm. about that. And um, it was a long weekend because of the 4th of July. Most of the base was going to be shut down, other than, you know, getting your food, stuff mm -hmm. like medical and all that stuff. And I remember this guy from, he came out of the administration building, and I think he was a yeoman, which was a Remington Raider. So, and he was, uh, he said, what are, you, what are you doing, you know, over the weekend? And I said, I'm just waiting to get out of here. He says, well, why don't you, he says, you know, they got a, Oh, a, a, a thing like they have in New Jersey where they have the, you know, the Ferris wheels and all this other stuff. So an amusement park. 
kind of yeah it was an amusement park but it was yeah but it was it was a smaller one but they had arcades mm -hmm. and he says if you're not doing anything he says let's go on in and screw around with that and i said eh, okay i'm not doing anything else so i went in with him and we went into this arcade and i was playing pinball which i never really play mm -hmm. you know but i was playing pinball and the next thing i knew this guy was not there two other guys had come in and they were watching me play you know pinball and stuff and so they kind of introduced themselves as, I don't know, some kind of an Iraqi or something, or blah, blah, blah. And I said, I understand that you might be looking for work. And I said, I'm going back home. I said, I have a job secured at Brunswick Corporation, which incidentally, uh, Jim, the, the, I forgot to mention this, that mortar that we did on the boat, manufactured by Brunswick Corporation. Anyway. I said, oh my gosh, I hope these guys weren't taking a coffee break when they put this together. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, I said, no, I'm going, they're holding my job at, at Brunswick, I'm gonna go home. And they said, well, we, we, we've got work for you here. And I said, well, doing what? And they said, well, we know that you're a pretty fair marksman. And basically, I'm sifting through this, and I'm thinking, yeah, what, so what do you want, what does that mean? They said, well, you know, would you like a job without committing to what? I said, no, I'm, I'm going back home. I don't want anything to do with this. Well, after I began to think about this, who would know more about, and I don't know whether these guys were government. I don't know whether they were mob. I have no idea. But who else would be able to tell them that other than the people that are working in the administration building and mm -hmm. what you had in your records? If this guy's a marksman, we can use him for something. Mm -hmm. No, no, I'm going home. <laughs> I'm going home. So, you know that it, that triggered while you, we were talking here, and I've told this to my wife. You know, and, and she's, and, but I'm here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm here. You know, I didn't want anything more to do with any of that business. So, um, came home, went back to work at Brunswick, and uh, um, met my wife, and um, she knew I was a Vietnam vet. Um, she didn't know much about, some of her friends had come home in body bags. Mm -hmm. She's a graduate of Mona Shores and some of her friends had come home in body bags. And she said, you know what? She said, I used to be cranked on rah, rah, United States, blah, 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 at, at the beginning of this. And uh, she's a school teacher, mm -hmm. she's college educated, very smart gal. And she says, as the war raged on and my friends were coming home in body bags, she says, it turned me so against that war. Not our soldiers, mm -hmm. but the war. She says, we could see. I said, one of the defining moments for me was Kent State. Fire upon your own people. Mm -hmm. Here are these people. I said, all they're there for is an education. You gave them one. And um, so it kind of soured me that way. Now, like I explained to you before, it isn't the war, the people that were involved in the war, it was the suits that put us there. Mm -hmm. And even though uh, I have forgiven them, I will never forget about them. And I told my wife after we had our children, I said, I will never, ever allow my kids to go to war unless they are on our ground. If they are not a direct threat, there is no way on God's green earth. I said, I said if I have to go to Alaska and raise potatoes and corn, mm -hmm. you know, I said, no, it's not going to happen. Okay. So what kind of career did you go into? 
I'm a, actually, I'm a, I went back to the reserves, mm -hmm. and my training officer was the union president at Story Chemical. And he had seen my progress and my uh, stuff that I was studying and everything. He says, he says, you know, he says, there are some openings coming out at Story Chemical. He says, for a mill, for millwright, and he says, why don't you come out and take a test? I said, what the heck's a millwright? He says, well, he says they're, he says they're mechanics. And um, he says, but you have to go through a battery of tests to do that, to get into the program. I said, well, I'll tell you what. His name was Daryl, Daryl Whitaker. And I said, I'll tell you what, Daryl. I said, I've got a couple weeks vacation coming from Brunswick. I said, if it's okay with them, I said, I'll, I'll uh, take a week out. He says, it'll be about three days, a battery of exams over three days. He says, not all day long. He said, but I said, oh, okay. I said, like what? He says, well, math. He said, general aptitudes, you know, mechanical aptitudes, stuff like that. I said, okay. So it was in, uh, so I took the exams and they called me up and said, well, we'd, we'd like to hire you to go through our apprenticeship. And it was through the U.S. Department of Labor, whole nine yards. And I said, well, I have, I have another week. I said, if, if it's all right with you, I said, I'd like to come out there and work in it for a week and then make my decision based upon that. I said, that's, that's fine. So I did, and I did, and I, you know, got into the program, and three and a half years later, I became a journeyman. And, and I worked in that probably for, as a mechanic, mechanic. They closed down in 1973, I think. So not too long then. Not too long, but th we worked a tremendous amount of overtime, and they applied our overtime hours because you have to put in a certain amount of hours to become a journeyman. Mm -hmm. And that consists of, uh, I had um, ICS courses, I had DuPont courses, I had courses at Muskegon Community College. Um, so anyway, you had to take these courses, and I, I completed all that before my time anyway. And the U.S. Department of, of Labor waived that time. They said, whether it's overtime or whether it ends, it's, it's OGT. It's on the job training, mm -hmm. you know. So got my card. And I worked in that trade for probably 40-some-odd years, Jim, but not always as a, uh, as a millwright. I went back to school, went back into advanced Meg and TIG welding, metallurgy, machine shop, stuff like that, because these, these were the fun courses. Mm -hmm. these were, and um, I realized that I wasn't college material, but I wanted a higher education in technology. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to say probably for the last 30 years before I retired, I was into supervision. Mm -hmm. And some of these, uh, I was in supervision at, uh, I became the maintenance manager at Brunswick. Um, I worked at various jobs. And I was kind of, um, I can see where my PTSD came into, I was an angry guy. And I mean, if that supervisor, if I didn't like his, tie that day. Mm -hmm. I just quit. Go on to something else. In that day and age you could. Mm -hmm. um, because skilled trades were just, I mean you could go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Walk across the street and get a job there. Well my wife and I were figuring this out here a while back and I had over that course I had over 54 jobs. And part of the when you have PTSD, a lot of that accompanies that. Mm -hmm. 
being very, very um, restless. And I didn't, I didn't need a, an excuse to, to quit or anything. Sometimes I just quit. Got fired from a couple of jobs. Um, in fact, one of them was Story Chemical. The guy was trying my patience for probably three months, and I finally, I mean, I, I busted him out pretty good. And, um, and I'm sorry for that. Now I didn't get fired because he had just gotten into it on the golf course with the personnel manager the night oh. before. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, got, I got out. He said, well, and my punishment was I couldn't drill anybody for six months, but this guy couldn't shoot his mouth off to anybody for six months. So I don't know which one was worse. I think he got the worst of the deal. Right. Now, uh, you mentioned the PTSD. At what point did you recognize that you had that? I didn't. Okay. I didn't recognize it until, because back then it wasn't a buzzword. Sure. We had no idea, you know, that that was uh, one of the common characteristics of post-traumatic stress disorder. Gotten into fights, and I mean, at one time, before my wife and I were married, before I met her, I mean, my big deal was uh, pizza, beer, and fight night, you know? Um, and that's kind of a sad thing to say, you know? Again, what did I turn into? You know, and you go through this self-analysis over the years, you know, of why did I become what I became? What, 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 what prompted that? And, um, but after, of course, after we had met and, you know, we had our kids and all that stuff, and um, I think I was very nice to my kids. I was very tolerant of them. My wife and I had a very rocky first seven years, very rocky. But the Lord bless, and I, uh, I uh, knew that I loved her. I wasn't so sure at that time whether she liked me a whole lot, mm -hmm. but we held it together, and uh, uh, we're extremely happy now. Uh, both of us are involved in, in ministry right now, one of them being in the uh, uh, Veterans Treatment Court. Mm -hmm. for Muskegon County. She works with the veterans' wives of us crazy guys that, you know. And quite frankly, uh, Jim, they are, uh, they are suffering from secondary PTSD. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. You know, for the most part, a lot of the times in self-defense mm -hmm. of the guy that, or person that they married. Yeah. Um, we were fortunate that our marriage worked out. What breaks my heart is there are a lot of them that don't. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can get to them in time. Sometimes you can't get to them in time. But when I made the move, I was ordained in, in 2007. And at the time, the church that I was, I was a pastor of visitation and evangelism. And we had decided to start a campground ministry. And we did that. We bought a trailer, a truck, and all that jazz, and we went out to the campgrounds. And I made a little display of all the flags, you know, all the, the United States flag and the uh, flag of Israel and uh, the Vietnam flag and the POW flag, POW flag. And these guys would always come by and they'd ask me about some of these flags and all that stuff. <clears throat> the majority of them were veterans. And of course, there, a lot of them were baby boomer veterans, same age as mm -hmm. me, or within a couple years, one way or the other. And I told my wife, I said, yeah, I'm wondering if the Lord's really directing us to minister to combat vets. And my wife, in her infinite wisdom, she said, well, Wes, she said, what is she in? She says, you are a combat vet. Who can they relate to better mm -hmm. than someone that's been there, done that? Yeah. And the majority of them, she was right, the majority of these guys will not talk to people unless you are a combat vet because, you know, it, then their whole thing is, and if I can quote, you ain't been there, you ain't done it. Mm -hmm. 
well, okay, yeah. you know. And uh, so a boyhood friend of mine at the time was the director of the Veterans Affairs for Muskegon County, a fellow by the name of Dave Ealing, very good friend of mine. We were raised together. And he said, Wes, he says, now you've been a pastor for a while. And he says, I, I know that you're not pastoring in that position in that church anymore. I said, no. I said, you know, I said, I feel my that the Lord has directed me outside of the church. I said, because you know, Dave, I said, the majority of these guys don't go to church. And I says, and I'm not saying that the answer, I said, is in religion, but it, for me, it is in the relationship with Christ, not, not the church. And I said, I see the downfall in man-made rules, man-made things, I said, that aren't really biblical and I said and I I can't do that I said when I deal with these guys I said I am constantly reminded these are my brothers these are souls and I can't help them if I don't believe in what I'm doing I said if that makes sense does it make perfect sense? When are you coming down? Mm -hmm. Well, we went through that for about three years. And I finally relented, and I said, well, Dave, I said, if you got a place for me down, he says, I got a room for you, and he says, and we can set you up, and he did. And we started ministering on a counseling basis with other vets. Then we had a, 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 a new wave that was sweeping in the judicial system dealing with vets. It was called treatment courts. Dave had gotten some people together to go down to or over to Washington, D.C. It was their first boot camp. Mm -hmm. And we went and we got our, uh, our prosecutor to go. We had the sheriff go. The judge went. Myself, my wife went. Of course, David And what an eye-opener that was, because you're rubbing shoulders with people that want to make the difference in a veteran's life and give them a second chance for those that are dealing with post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. disorder, traumatic brain injuries, or closed head injuries. And it just made perfect sense to us. And we did that we had a group of people that would come in before we went to Washington, D.C. We had a group of people that was doing this out in Oklahoma, you know, places like that, which made a tremendous amount of sense to all of us, and we did that. And we were getting veterans in there, and Jimmy was making a difference in their lives. What we found over the years that what's happening with these guys, first of all, they go in for care to the VA. And thank God there is a VA, by the way. I have never gotten poor care from them. And I'm 100% disabled through them. But what would happen is that a lot of these guys would be put on psychotropics. And they would get out and they would mix these psychotropics with alcohol or drugs or both. Mm -hmm. And that turns into a very toxic cocktail. And they run in and they have brushes with the law. And it's usually DUIs and all of that. Some of them are domestic disputes. Um, we generally don't take cases that are violent cases, uh, murder, rape, that, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. 
But we have taken some that have gotten into domestic violence. And um, we found that it, it made a big difference. Uh, one of our key star guys tried to commit suicide twice by bullet. He was so drunk, he said, and Dan will laugh at this time about, you know, when he talks about this. He says, I was so drunk. He said, I had it in right at my head. He says, I was so drunk. He said, I passed out. The gun fired. The bullet went into the wall. And he said, what I'm here for is that a, a discharge of firearm inside the village. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he turned out to be a world class guy because he is a mentor now in, our, in mm -hmm. our court and we're getting more and more people that have gone through that court to become mentors mm -hmm. in helping these people are you dealing mostly with the sort of your generation are you getting younger veterans now we're getting oh yeah we're getting young vets um because now the iraqi vets are the older vets yeah you know and the afghan vets not they're coming in but not like the iraqi vets did yeah we sent rather larger numbers of people to Iraq than Afghanistan. I mean, yes. we, we were in Afghanistan first, but, yes. but in relatively small numbers to yep. start with. But yeah, but exactly. they're still on, ongoing. Yeah, and but at first it was Vietnam vets. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what got around. Of course, we're baby boomers, and that that seemed to get around. But um, when we came to the Iraqi vets, boy, what a treasure trove of guys that was. Lots of them. Lots of them, Jim, and, and a lot of them are dealing with moral injury, a lot of them. Um, one of the guys was telling me, he said he was, he was involved in armor, and he said we'd go by, you know, of course they had this Republican guard and all this and blah, blah, blah. He says they didn't stand a chance, he says, against our, our mm -hmm. firepower, not a chance. He says, our tanks were so much more advanced than theirs, laser lock-on mm -hmm. and all that business. And he said, you know, you'd go by on your way to Baghdad, and you'd go by these tanks that were just burned out cinders. And he says, sometimes the bodies were still on there. And, and I said, you know, the sad part about that is, is that that's somebody's brother. Right. Or, you know, that, that's the thing that I always mm -hmm. come back to, Jim. Mm -hmm. And I know dealing with moral injury I know how that feels, mm -hmm. so I can relate to yeah. these guys how that feels, and uh, in in how to approach them about that. Because you know, a lot of these guys they harbor that, they hold that in, and they harbor that, thinking that if I the same way I felt, if I tell that to my wife, is she going to think differently of me? than when she first met me, mm -hmm. even though I'm the same guy, you know. Um, and so they harbor that, and they continue to live with it. And so that's the point of that ministry, is to help, not to beat them up with the Bible. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't need that. They already know who they are and what they are, you know. They need to know that there's something outside of that. Mm -hmm. And the only way, and we used to hear all this business about psychology and this and that and the other thing, and I said, and that's okay to a certain level. I said, but sometimes you've got to get to the inner level, and that's the spirit. Mm -hmm. You can't get there psychologically. You can only get there through faith. And um, some will disagree with me, and that's okay but I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen what works. That coupled with psychology, now you're, now you're, now you're doing something, you know. You're dealing with forgiveness. You're dealing with why you did what you did, mm -hmm. you know. And when psychology comes into it, now we can help you from here. Now that you've recognized you have this problem, now we can help you with this. And, and I thank the VA for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 of course, the medical issues that they're dealing with. I'm dealing a lot with the Agent Orange thing, which is concentrated in the rivers because of stormwater right. runoff. Right. So, um, so we're dealing with that. Um, we host a, 
several veterans' events where they can just come and lay, you know, let their hair down. We were facilitators of a PTSD group for mm -hmm. probably seven years, mm -hmm. and now one of one of my best friends is now doing that with his wife. Uh, we just became so busy that uh, I attend this thing every once in a while, but you know, and I should probably attend it more. Well, it, it's a pretty long way from enlisting in the Navy to stay out of Vietnam and go on a battleship. The long ways. But you've kind of brought it around full circle and, and put yourself back into a good place and you can do positive things from where you are. Well, it's a good place for me and I hope it's a good place for them. Uh, we try to. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm a cross between a pacifist and a, and a patriot. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there's going to be wars and I know there's going to be rumors of wars, Jim. I already know that. But where do we go from here? Where, where, do, we, where do we go with in the wake of that? Where do we go? Mm -hmm. Do we become staunch and say, well, just live with it, guys, and that's, this is just the way it is? Or are we going to be compassionate and understand, okay, I know why we went here is to protect our families and our grandkids and our freedoms and all that, but, but what about the wake of that? Because there, even though there is collateral damage, a lot of that is with our own troops. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is with our own troops. Yeah, very much so. All but right. Anyway, I, we are where we are, and I am where I am, and I'm comfortable in that. Um, uh, we, I would like to see more veterans comfortable with that, and uh, my wife and I are both working toward that. And sometimes that's a long struggle, Jim. That isn't something you get over overnight, particularly when you've been dealing with it for the last what, 47, 48 years, mm -hmm. 50 years for some. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in and sharing well, your story today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.